right, call to order the um, work session for the Fayette County Board of Education. Um, are there any uh, changes to the agenda? No, sir. We're ready for the board to approve as submitted. Okay, just need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right, we'll kick off with the presentations. Okay, first on our uh, presentation agenda is health and physical education adoption presentation. I know uh, Dr. Morgan is going to give us a real quick update on our progress and let us know where we are. So, Dr. Morgan, if you will. No, it's not. Okay, it's on now. Mm -hmm. I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so good afternoon again, everyone. Um, Lakisha and I are really excited. Sorry, Ms. Bonner and I are really excited to present um, our proposed documents for your consideration um, to kind of streamline the health and PE process. But to make this process um, um, open to the public, um, we wanted to create a couple of um, websites and key pages, so we'll walk you through um, some of the information that the public will see. Um, and then with your approval, we would like to have it um, published on our media site so that community members as well as vendors can start completing surveys if they would like to be on the committee. So the first thing that we're going to show you is our public page. So, okay, can you click on the, thank you. All right, so this is on our FCBOE page and we work with instructional, we work really closely with instructional technology to one, get this page up and running, um, as well as create vendor surveys with all of the information that the vendors need to, um, for us to adopt their book. As you know, we're looking, we've adopted um, Chromebooks um, K through 12, so we really want to maximize on our digital resources. So the first thing that this page basically outlines, it tells you what we're looking for. We're looking for material that's going to help our students um, stay physically active, not just K through 12, but for life. Um, and what are some of the things that we need to do to incorporate a balanced um, materials adoption? And so you'll see links to our standards. Um, please note that the health standards are under revision right now. So that's something that we've placed on, the, um, on our public sites to so just let them know that that's under revision. Um, the first link um, is going to be information for stakeholders. So that first bold is if you want information about our process. So can you right click it so the first one doesn't click out? The first one. No, um, under information for stakeholders. Yeah, that one. And then right, yes, to open it in the new tab. Perfect. So we've created a link. So this is if you are the general public and you want to know about our adoption process, this right here will take you to it. And um, if you scroll down, it just talks about what we're looking for, um, our timeline, um, which we've presented, as well as if you have any questions for um, both Ms. Bonner and I, how to contact us. So if you scroll down a little bit, um, you'll see some important documents that they kind of need, that the public needs, as well as community members um, and some of our um, committee members. And so they have documents, links to all the respective curriculum standards and documents there. Um, so if you go back to the main page, thank you. The second one is going to be if you would like to be an adoption committee member. So if you would like to be an adoption committee member, you'll click on this link right here. And basically it talks about what we're looking for. And if you scroll down some more, you'll see the link to be on the survey. And then you'll also see an anticipated link for the people that are going to be on the timeline. So you want to talk about the survey now? Okay. So. The first document that we want to propose for your consideration in your folder is the third document. 
that outlines the Adoption Committee survey. And basically it tells you that we're looking for resources that's gonna accelerate our students' understanding of health and physical education with, res with respect to the appropriate um, state standards. The next, things that, next thing it talks about or it outlines is an anticipated timeline. If you decide to be on our committee, or if you would like to be on our committee, how much time this is going to take. So we'll probably meet once a month between now and April when everything is finally adopted. And we've prepared an anticipated timeline for you. So the first meeting, um, the first thing is that this survey survey will close on October 31st. That gives us time to get everything in a document, um, an Excel sheet and respective documents to give to all of the board members in consideration for um, review during the November work session. So on November 8th, so we're hoping that we can get on the November work session to review the survey responses. And on November 8th, the committee is going to come, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll be notified of their status. And on the 11th, they'll come in to look at some of the vendors. So we've, we're going to push out the vendor survey, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then we'll come together to meet it. Um, then in December, we want them to come and look at the internal rubrics for all of the vendors that's basically said that, hey, we would like to submit um, our sample materials to you all. We've evaluated them, and now we're going to um, compare to our internal rubric to see who's going to advance. The vendors that are going to advance will come and meet with the committee in January. And so after that, after they come in and do a meeting in February, all of the committee members will come together and we'll propose a memo to you all saying these are the top vendors that we would like to consider for our health and physical education material, instructional materials. Um, in March, the material will be available for public display. So we like to publish our materials per our board policy for at least 30 days so that the public um, can review the materials in all of our school sites as well as the LAC. And there's also a, um, a, a survey link that's um, posted with the material. So if they have any feedback or comments or concerns about the instructional materials, they can um, submit those anonymously and then you all will get that um, feedback in March or the end of March. Um, and then April and May, we would like for the committee to come back together so that they can review the comments that the public has submitted based off of the public display of material. Um, and then they will revise the memo that they're submitting so they'll tell you if they want to continue with the, with the recommendations or if they would like to revise their recommendations and we'll present that back to you in April um, and in May. And then if everything goes well, you all will vote on the proposed materials in April and May um, for purchase in May and June in training during post-planning or pre-planning depending on our academic calendar. All right, so that's the first one. So here are a couple of questions that we proposed and we would love your feedback. Um, this is so that if anybody um, any stakeholder, business partner, parent, family would like to be a part of this committee, we want for them to complete this survey. And we've kind of used some of the guiding documents from the State Board of Education in terms of who, um, who the state says um, shall be on the committee. So the first thing is their prefix, um, first name, last name, suffix, the organization that they're representing, and if none, that's fine. If they're a parent, that's fine. The email address so that we can communicate with them. We all we always ask for them to include their email address a second time because if there's something, if the first one gets bounced, then they'll have access to the second one. Hey, Dr. Marchman, can we give him a photo? Okay. Oh, you. Okay. So right now we're talking about the proposed. Um, survey for people that would like to be on the adoption committee and it is the third document in the purple folder uh, next we have phone number the mailing address um, because sometimes we'll have to um, send hard copies of materials to our adoption committee and then there's a question on number 10 if you would like to serve on the health um, the physical education committee or you have no preference you would just like to be involved and then um, Question 11, we stated state board policy 160-4-2.12, um, which states that the committee members shall be comprised of mostly non-teaching parents and shall be augmented by members um, of the community, such as educators, health professionals, and other community represent, um, representatives. So we've asked for them to best describe the worlds that describe them. And over here, the state board says that you 
we must have um, a male student and a female student in grades 11 or 12. So there's a selection box for them as well. So we have one for um, male student, um, grade 11 or 12, female 11 or 12, educator with students in the system, educator without students in the system. And that's because our state board says that it should be comprised mostly of non-teaching parents. So that's why that question is important. Um, healthcare professionals. Um, for example, dietitian, medical doctors, RNs, um, mental health professionals. Dr. Morgan, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I mean, we, we have the material okay. here, so I'm not sh sure we have to go through every No, I don't, I don't <laughs> you're saving me time if you don't want to, but that's fine. I just want to know if there's anything that you wanted to add to this survey. Because I, this I is what's going to go I just want to ask a around. question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we recommended somebody to be on this committee, do they still have to go on and fill all this information out, or are they going to be notified to fill it out? Um, we would like for them to fill it out because we would like to keep it um, just a streamlined process so that everyone on the committee can see everyone that's... Okay, so are we supposed, like, am I supposed to call this person to tell them they have to do this, or is... Yes. I gave the name to, to Kay. To Kay, yeah. So and then, is she going to contact them, or do I have to contact them? Yes, um, either Kay, yes, Kay can okay. contact them and send them the link. We just want to make sure that you all were aware of this document before we started publishing it. And we'll, of course, ask um, Melinda to pl publish it on our, you know, our our media sites as well. But we want to make sure that this survey is okay with you all. If there's any additional boxes that you think we're missing. I'm sorry, what was the answer to Roy's question? Because I, I got the same situation. I, I sent people and... Yes. They, are you... Who's going to... What? Kay. Kay, 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 Kay will send them the link if they would like to serve on the, to serve on the committee. And if you yes, right. and if you've given them the reason why we haven't contacted anyone is because we wanted this to be approved by you first, and so that's why we've placed a hold on contacting any members, only because we want to make sure everybody agreed with this survey before we move forward. And if there are specific um, folks that y'all are recommending be on the committee, we still want them to fill out the questionnaire because then that way it's the same for everyone, mm -hmm. and the database that's created would include their names. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right, okay. so that's for the vendor. So with your, um, so we'll start posting this on our media sites, and um, if anyone's interested, they can of course um, get it through, and we'll send you the link as well. I'll send Dr. Barrett the link to our public site, so if anyone has any questions, they have access. It'll describe the entire process on there, um, and then lastly, the information for vendors. So you can, yeah, you can actually click vendors on that site right there. Okay. And so if you are a vendor and you're interested in submitting your um, your materials, so we are a closed district, textbook adoption district, like most schools in the state of Georgia, that means that vendors cannot just email individual teachers sample materials um, for consideration. They must email the committee. And so if they're interested in um, submitting their information, we've outlined the procedure for them to do so, as well as a survey. So if you have any um, vendors, most of our major vendors, they understand this process, but smaller vendors, like such as AV Pride, will explain the process to them. They will complete this survey. And in includes the tech questions that we need as well. So if a textbook company or a materials company would like to submit um, resources for recommendation or for consideration, they need to complete this survey. So they have a different survey. And this is the survey that the committee will review all of the responses and choose who will advance. Okay. Can you clarify what a closed system means? Um, so a teacher can't choose their own, teachers can't choose their own materials for any subject, I assume. Um, yes, well. But can, are we also restricted by the State Board of Education? Are we restricted? Yeah. No, we are not restricted anymore. We used to be, right. um, I would say about four years ago, we had a system where uh, the adoptions went through the state, yeah, the state um, but books, they, we don't do that anymore. So we're free to choose whatever resources, as long as they align, as long as the committee picks it, the board um, adopts it, and they align to our curricular standards. Any other questions, yeah. board? <coughs> Looks good. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. We'll uh, uh, move forward with this process. Okay. And um, just for clarification, board members, I know uh, several of you have submitted names. They'll absolutely be on the committee. Uh, we've gotten those names to uh, Ms. Sykes. She'll make sure they complete it just so that we can have a list of everybody. <laughs> our goal uh, with this process is to be very transparent in our community and 
uh, we'll continue to move through it. And if you have questions as we move through, please don't hesitate to let us know. Yeah, I do have one more question because um, I just spoke to the guy last week about a history textbook, and I said, I'm sorry, you got to talk to the state board. But so, so that's not true anymore. We can so our district chooses our own textbooks. Yes, and we and go through an subject. adoption. We select the adoption cycle now. Like back in the day, we would be on a um, instructional material cycle. So they would define like every five years, math will go. Um, they stopped doing that because um, it depends on the district's um, funds, availability of funds, and we can't really mandate that 2020 will be the adoption for every district in the state of Georgia to adopt history books so because of it. Math history. English yes. We now, can we can tell use. you that there are a couple that are um, forthcoming. Um, right now, of course, we have health and physical education. We're working with um, with um, Mr. Gray to kind of come up with a timeline so that we don't have the major um, vendors going, our subjects going at the same time. Like, you don't want math and ELA going at the same time because it's going to cost a lot of money to run those simultaneously. So we decide that locally. Mm -hmm. Okay. No other Thank questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good deal. Uh, Mr. Hollowell, next on our agenda is our Fayette County High School feeder pattern presentation. And uh, uh, I think you can tell who the, the members are of the feeder pattern. They're dressed quite well. Uh, I do know Ms. Southers is not able to be here That's today. Great. She had a uh, family medical okay. issue, and um, she gives her regrets in not being here and said she'd be happy to answer uh, any questions specifically about Cleveland. Uh, but I know the, the committee is going to present on her behalf. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Ms. YBJ. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I am Yolanda Briggs Johnson, principal of the Fayette County High School, and I'd like to reintroduce you to excellence and creativity in Fayette County. We are the Fayette County feeder pattern. Ms. Tabitha Lawrence, Fayetteville Elementary School, Ms. Jamie Munoz, Spring Hill Elementary School, and Dr. Marcus Broadhead, Bennett's Mill Middle School. This afternoon, Fayette Feeder Pattern Principals will share with you the innovative and next level programming that is taking place at our schools. We have designed a playbook of action steps that promote the growth that is Fayette County. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as you take a look at our playbook, I want to just kind of um, specify how we've broken it down. And so you'll see um, three different content, three different areas. Each area has a section titled What's in Play. What's in Play, we consider the things that we're doing well, some of the strengths that we're bringing to our presentation today, and watching film speaks to those areas of growth for our feeder pattern. So I'm going to speak to you now regarding academics. What's in Play? All elementary schools have experienced growth in English language arts and utilize the support of our RTI interventionists and Title I teachers to support students to increase learning outcomes. Continued focus on writing instruction and focus on student engagement and rigor is, rigor is also taking place in our schools. Each elementary school also provides academic support for students and families outside of the, uh, of the traditional school day. Many of our schools hold Saturday academies. Some of our schools even go out into, the, into neighborhoods and communities to provide tutoring and other instructional supports. At the middle school level, there is a huge focus on writing across the curriculum using Think Circa. Title I teachers are also being utilized as co-teachers in sixth grade to support writing. At Fayette County High School, the Tiger Academy was established to assist ninth graders with their transition to high school and all core classes are, um, that take place on one main hallway with a focus on student engagement and creativity and social emotional learning. Watching film, each elementary school did experience a decrease in social studies this year. Um, Cleveland is participating in math PLC with instructional coaches to, to monitor math progress, also participating in SEEKS training for social and emotional learning. FES has a focus on math to address the slight drop in math performance. Um, we're also utilizing our county level instructional support team with a focus on student engagement and effective tier one instruction, specifically focused on differentiated instruction. Spring Hill experienced a decrease in math and science. Title teachers are supporting math in all grades with the math PLC and the utilization of the instructional coach. 
I would like to now speak to culture and climate. What's in play? All of our schools in the feeder pattern have implemented PBIS now for several years, and we have all experienced the benefits of PBIS with our students and staff. At the elementary level, we are focused on communication, building relationships, and a sense of community, implementing ex extracurricular clubs, facilitating professional learning communities, and two of our three elementary schools are Leader in Me schools. At the middle school level, we are focused on a structured time for students to socialize in a healthy and appropriate manner, fostering student-teacher relationships through new extracurricular clubs and ensuring that guidance lessons are taking place in classrooms. At the high school, we have, very, have a very similar focus in place. Um, Fayette County High School is focused on strong communication with their parents and staff and professional learning on creating positive classroom environments with an instructional focus every month. Watching film. At the elementary level, we are intentional in our efforts to build strong and healthy relationships with all of our students. We recognize and value the importance of relationships with kids. In growing, we're also working on growing our staff's cultural responsiveness, um, behavior training, and trauma training. We recognize that these are specific areas that our students need support in and our staff as well. At the middle school level, we continue to work on ways to intentionally support our students with transitioning to middle school where their environment and expectations are very different from those that they experienced in elementary school. And at the high school level, we are intentional in reteaching behaviors and emphasizing the importance of making responsible choices. Um, school counselors are facilitating character ed lessons and social emotional learning lessons to students who are working in and in and in school suspension setting. These efforts are proven to be very impactful at every level and we main maintain commitment to each and every avenue possible to teach and reteach our students. Good afternoon, I'm Jamie Munoz, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about community. As far as what's in play, in the Fayette County feeder pattern, we value stakeholder and parent relationships. So we have a number of initiatives in play to engage our community. Those include, we partner with one another in our feeder pattern and with local churches to host student events. We provide opportunities to engage students and parents outside of the school day, including some of the things Ms. Lawrence mentioned, Tutor Tuesdays, Saturday School, and parent universities. We also offer a variety of multicultural events and celebrations, as well as PTO volunteer opportunities. And while we have lots in play, we're always continuing to want to watch film. Despite our efforts, we continue to work to grow our presence in the community. We're continuing to invite in stakeholders to our schools, and we are aware that we need to provide creative and innovative ways for engagement. We aim to increase social media presence as it is accessible to all, despite availability and busy work schedules. We intend to increase PTO participation and access. And we also intend to strengthen relationships with business partners and organizations. In elementary school, there's a first grade student who has foster parents from a situation that we don't know particularly what the specifics are. But in every class that she's in, there's behavior that the student has exhibited in ways that whether we're in tears, uh, whether it's any other kind of support that we provide, this particular student has gaps and has areas of need by which the school can't support the student. In middle school, there's a student that has not been in one elementary school for more than a year, who's been moved six times because his mother kidnapped him. Despite how much we hug them, despite how many smiles we provide for the student, there are gaps and there's trauma that the student, ex that has, the student has that we are not equipped to be able to support that student. There are many times that we see students, such as the two that I just mentioned to you, that exhibit behaviors that we don't understand and that we cannot support. This feeder pattern is a direct reflection of the things that are happening in society. 
and we are not in a position to be insulated to ignore the varying degrees by which students are being impacted daily. What we see is trauma. It is not just anxiety. There are many behaviors that are erupting from these students because they have surviving. Despite the fact that we do whatever we can for every kid that walks through that door, despite the idea that we do what's best, despite the fact that we have individual education programs or plans, despite the fact that there's training, despite the fact that there's counselors, despite the fact that there's every day that we come in, we smile, and we try to be consistent, and we try to provide, provide behaviors and, and excuse me, PBIS and expectations and consistency, despite the fact that we are trying to maintain a, a, an area by which every student who walks in can have some form of peace, it is not enough. A lot of what we do as educators has not caught up to what society has in store for our children. And as much as we try to make an adjustment day in and day out, we are not doing enough because we don't know how to do enough. We do our best, but our best isn't good enough because of the trauma that exists in every one of our students that, we, that occupy our buildings. It is very unfortunate to feel as though as principals in our feeder pattern that we say to, our, say to our parents that we are here to, be, to provide safety as well as education as our priority, knowing in our hearts that in as much as we try to provide everything that we can, that there's still a gap in what we can support for our children. And as abysmal as it may sound, the reality is that we have to teach every kid that walks through that door. We do not know their story, but we understand that there's so much more beneath them that we have to address in a manner that is still a gap in our education and our resources that I just wanted to present to you to help you to understand there's a larger picture behind the numbers that you received in that pamphlet or the playbook that we presented to you today. So in closing, <laughs> <laughs> we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the resources that you provided thus far. But we wanted to give you a snapshot, not just to the data, but to the, the things that are underneath the data, the grandparents, the parents, the guardians, the foster parents, the principals, the teachers, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, everyone who pours into our kids to help you understand that it takes all of us to do a very Herculean task, and we're still at a place where we look for support from you. So we thank you for your time. Questions? Board members? Yeah, I was just thinking as you're talking, um, I, I know we're in the K-12 business, but how do we train these families? How do we train the people that take care of them once we put them on the bus? And I know that's not your issue, but I guess as a community, I'm just thinking, you know, how, who do we partner with and who, who do we pass the kid off to when they um, leave our doors? And uh, I know you've got some great partnerships. But uh, the other question that I was thinking is, um, I know you guys are doing a great job. And, um, and when you play football, you know how to keep score. When you play baseball, you know how to keep score. When I kick the ball through the goal, I know how to keep score. I don't know how to keep score <laughs> when you've got the type of clientele that you, you're describing. And uh, just, just knowing in my heart that you're doing a great job, I, I want to put something on the scoreboard <laughs> and say, look what a great job these guys are doing. And um, so any help you can give in that respect, if you think about that, and I don't know, that's, that's all I got. Thank you. So. Dr. Marchman, one thing I would, I would comment on, um, I, I think all of our feeder patterns are doing exceptional work. I, I certainly would say that about the Fayette County high school feeder pattern. Um, one of the things that I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want anyone walking away and not feeling good about the work that's happening there. I feel like it's, uh, we're making good progress. The, I think particularly the point that Dr. Broadhead was trying to make is we've got some outstanding students all across that feeder pattern that are doing tremendously well. But the kids that do come with those gaps, they're not so numerous, but they do consume a lot of the time, energy, and effort of the, 
the staff. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think uh, we can continue to provide additional support. Am I wrong when I say that? Uh, we have phenomenal kids and doing great, great work. Um, but we do have some students that just really need more horsepower, and we've been trying to allocate that. The question you ask about how do we teach our parents, um, I can say this. I know particularly with Title I, we have tremendous engagement activities, and uh, we do have those parent universities where parents actually come in, and we're working to try to help provide uh, better parenting skills and how the school and the parent-home relationship can improve. Uh, I think those things are very important. Um, the process is if, if the kids and the parents come and they stay, we can move the needle. We can make that school board look better. It's when they're transitory so much, they move from place to place. That's, that, in, that, that makes the challenges a little bit tougher. Um, but regardless of the circumstances, uh, we're going to continue to move this needle forward. And uh, I want to commend our principals here. I was, I was here. also thinking along those lines here, what's important to teach the kids? And uh, I got several buddies that go over there, and uh, one of them uh, took four years of Spanish and can't speak a lick of Spanish, but she's about to get into veterinary school. <laughs> so um, she learned something that carried her through college, and um, she's doing amazing. And I got another little buddy who's going to pharmacy school, and others are doing great things. But... Um, I guess the question is, we're measuring things mm -hmm. that might not be the important things to measure because the kids that go through the system and take advantage of the education that's there are, are achieving great things post they are. Um, they are. high school. Well, and, you know, the, the other thing, uh, of course, graduation rate is not just on uh, Miss Yolanda's back. I mean, everybody in that group there shares a part of that. But they're also doing some pretty cool and innovative things with the ninth grade academy. I think that's uh, really something that we need to highlight and commend. Uh, we're working directly with those ninth grade students, and that's where, uh, if we're going to lose students, that's where we lose them is in ninth grade. And we're already seeing, even just in the first year of its implementation, only just a couple months, we've already seen some amazing uh, improvements compared to last year when the ninth grade was in the general population. We're being able to narrow in on their needs and focus uh, better attendance, uh, better discipline, uh, and I think that's going to lead to better academic achievement. It is actually already shown we have a higher percentage of students passing through their progress. We're at the nine-week mark, and we have a higher percentage of our ninth graders passing through their progress. And that's one of the reasons why we have a huge. So good things are happening. Um, I'd have, uh, again, congratulations on all the great work you guys are doing. Um, I'd have, I'm more curious, I guess, but, but a question. This maybe start with Dr. Uh, uh, Broadhead. Um, you I said you've added a number of clubs and organizations. Yes. Um, are there are there some that are doing better than others? Which ones have kind of hit or sort of sparked with the kids? Or well, the difference between what we used to do in the past and now is the fact that we have clubs that exist because students want them. Um, before right. there were things that existed because they always existed, right. and I, I I ask students before we talk about any club or activity, think about it being bigger than you. It has to be your legacy that you're leaving versus it's just something me and my friends like to do. Uh, I said everything that we do is about, if we start it, it's about what we are as a school versus it just being about something for right now. So they, we go through a process. They um, share information with me, tell me about what it is they're going to do, how is it they're going to add to the school, and how they're going to add to the culture of the school, uh, and find a, uh, a teacher to sponsor that event or that organization. Uh, there's no teacher in the building that does not have an outside responsibility or commitment in some form or fashion, to whether it be a club, volunteering, doing something Saturday remediation or enrichment, or just coming to a game, coming to a drama performance, or coming to some type of event at the school. So as I mentioned, we're all in with respect to how we are supporting students. So it is more student driven than it's ever been before, and it's about sustainability versus it being something to do with the kids for right now. That, that's terrific. And then I had a, um, a question for YBJ. Um, I saw in the presentation that you're um, uh, using teacher leaders to handle sort of low-level discipline. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that, that's been working?
four APs and sometimes you just can't put your arms around all of that in a day when you have multiple referrals coming in. So in an effort to support our teachers, but more importantly, support our students so that they have opportunity to learn from whatever choice they made, we um, have a teacher leader in place and he teaches his, um, his, his courses. He's um, an English teacher and AP, our AP art history teacher. But two of his periods are dedicated to working with our low-level discipline and seeing those students immediately. So there is literally a 24-hour turnaround, and it doesn't just include seeing the student and giving him the student his or her discipline, but it also encompasses um, speaking with parents, making sure they understand that the student has made a choice, this is a choice they've made, this is a consequence, and oftentimes it may just be a parent, student, um, teacher leader conference where they're talking about why did you make this decision? What led you to this? As opposed to just giving discipline. And we typically don't see those students make those same choices again, which eliminates that discipline, which is why our discipline work has gone down tremendously. I, th I think that's awesome. Um, and then just to uh, Dr. Broadhead's um, earlier point, um, we, we understand that um, the student who needs the most love isn't going to ask in a loving way. <laughs> so uh, we understand some of those, those challenges. And um, um, as a board, we're here to support you with extra resources when we can. And um, please let your staff know just how appreciative the board is and the administration is of all the work they're doing day to day. We really do appreciate it. And, and we do think you guys are doing great work. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'd just like to make one again. Congratulations on the work that you do. And I know that you know this, and I'm sure you're doing it, but when you're working with the at-risk kids, the vertical teaming is imperative. And I know that you all are meeting more than just sitting here together when you present to the board, but that helps kids a whole bunch. And I mentioned the same thing at the last uh, uh, presentation we had from the last feeder pattern, and that's, that's a tremendous asset to the kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is uh, a conversation about some of our Eng English language arts achievement. I know our board is uh, particularly uh, interested in, in how well we're doing there. Uh, Dr. Turner is going to come and share just a little bit of information. Uh, we're somewhat handicapped here because the, the actual data we've received, but it's embargoed. And uh, we'll be able to share that, uh, hopefully, in, in the near future. Uh, but uh, we do feel good about the growth that we've had, uh, particularly in the English language arts. So Dr. Turner. Yes, yeah, so in all transparency, today's presentation is a little bit of a punt. Um, what was scheduled was for Brian Butera to present to you all on graduation rate. But those uh, numbers came in early, so we did that presentation at the last board meeting and then but we still want to continue with our habit of looking to our model of achievement and accountability so I told Dr. Barra I would put this presentation together I did have numbers in there and then uh, someone reminded me that those the data is still embargoed until CCRPI all the data drops and the scores are finalized so I quickly edited to um, a much shorter version um, but what you'll see when the data does drop is that we have had some significant gains in ELA and in literacy. And so what I started this presentation with is the story behind those upward trends that you're going to see. Um, as you know, we adopted ReadyGen a few years ago. Um, and uh, that curriculum resource shifted our approach to teaching ELA and literacy to more of a conceptual approach of teach the thinking behind the task. Um, what happens is we take those thinking strategies, such as cause and effect, main idea, those kinds of things, and um, we link those with lessons that spiral through throughout the year. So it's not kind of a, oh, we're going to, in this unit, we're going to teach you this skill, and then we don't go back to that. They're constantly referring to those skills. What's significant is that we apply reading skills to any text, so it's not just we're teaching main idea with this text and then we move on to something different with the next um, novel or book, and that we apply writing skills across all genre, and we're constantly going back to texts that we've read to cite evidence to support either our main idea um, or to support an opinion that is made. Um, again, we don't teach skills in isolation with trying to get mastery in one unit or module. 
um, the curriculum keeps keeps coming back to those skills and we're hoping to reach mastery by the end of the year so that is what created the impetus for us to create standards-based report cards because what we saw was our old report card just really couldn't appropriately communicate um, the way the standards were being taught and then in middle and high school um, where we are re-emphasizing instruction on close reading and emphasizing those writing strategies. As you see there, those the, there are those overarching essential questions for teachers to help guide their teaching, and it's kind of incremental of what is the text saying, how does it work, what does the text mean, what is the how does it inspire you, and there's more emphasis on connecting traditional pieces of literature with more relevant text. So say, for example, in ninth grade, they might be teaching To Kill a Mockingbird. That's a wonderful, beautiful um, <coughs> novel that has been taught for years. But now they'll pull in more modern text, more um, maybe more nonfiction text relating to issues of class, gender, and racism. Um, we're always writing, writing, writing. Lots of formative assessment there. And then we're using uh, common summative writing frames um, so that we're seeing how, can they really apply what they're learning. Um, when the numbers do drop, I'll be back to share that with you, uh, and I think you'll be pleased with what you said. What did you say about class, gender, and racism? I said now, for example, when they teach To Kill a Mockingbird, um, we, in, the, in the old days, the old way, you just focused on the novel. And so what they do now is they, they might pull in other nonfiction text about race, class, and gender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the central themes of the book. And um, just making whole, it more relevant for students. Are they reading whole books or just excerpts or? Um, well, they, they essentially study the, the anchor text, the novel, mm -hmm. but then they're pulling in text from other resources that might, it might just be um, an excerpt. It could be an original primary source document. It could be, um, like an editorial that's written or published somewhere, just to get kids thinking and seeing how, yes, this is literature that's been around for a long time, but this is why it's still relevant because you see these themes occurring gotcha. in other um, texts that you would read, fiction or nonfiction. Okay. Any thank you. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Tolliver will jump on down to superintendent's report. Uh, Mr. Satterfield is out in the audience. I'll ask him to come on up just to give us a real brief update with regard to our facilities. Uh, and we've got uh, a lot of stuff that's happening still. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll try to go quickly through this. There, there are a lot of a lot of projects winding down or starting up. But Fayette High, the contractor. Uh, is still working on a few odds and ends on his punch list, and it's also doing some e exterior painting on on the field house. I noticed last week he was finishing up that and looked real real good. Uh, Macintosh, uh, we did have the ribbon cutting for the new classroom edition last Friday. It was very well attended, and uh, everybody seemed to enjoy the uh, festivities. Uh, the LEC. A contractor still working on a few odds and ends here, and we're also developing the plans. Uh, we met with Technology Services last week and are developing the plans for refurbishing uh, their area of the old Votet building. Uh, Oak Grove, uh, of course, the new bus loop and uh, parking areas were completed. Uh, Mija has, has moved the uh, a portable uh, office on site got that installed last week and they're getting ready to crank up on the administrative and uh, gym addition uh, that that should be breaking ground probably next week uh, booth middle school we've gotten the gmp has been determined for that project uh, safety and security upgrades contractors winded down on his punch list He's probably about 98, 99% complete there. The uh, Sandy Creek Film Lab, um, we, we've got the CO there. We're installing some new equipment, and the contractor's uh, finishing up their punch list. 
Uh, North Fayette, uh, have the CO contractor finishing up the punch list there. Um, it's, it's about 98% complete. On the high school track <clears throat> upgrades, we've got the new track installed. The, the rubber's been installed at Whitewater High School. Still got to uh, stripe it. Uh, we've moved, he's moved over to McIntosh and has started working on uh, installing the, the rubber base there. Uh, so hopefully within a couple of weeks, he'll be completely through with the rubber installation at McIntosh and can get that striped. Um, the, the last one was the improvements to the roads and, and parking lots, the drive lane at, at North Fayette. Um, last Tuesday, we opened up the new drive lane for parents to utilize that. And um, it, it was, in my 25 years, I'd have to say it was one of my better days. We, we had uh, parent, uh, uh, Miss Lisa and I were out directing traffic, and we had parent after parent stop, roll down the window, and say, this is great, and how much they appreciated it. And we did not back any traffic out onto the road whatsoever. And that was normally a daily occurrence, and uh, didn't even get close to backing out on the road. So. I, I think uh, that that was a uh, a good project, money worth worthwhile spent. There. And Mike, she also mentioned that was in the morning, the afternoon. Um, she was extremely pleased as well. She said only at right at dismissal did the first car back up down to the highway, which is completely different than backing up all the way down the highway. So she was she was really excited. Yeah and pleased with that project so thank you guys yeah thank you very much any questions for mr satterfield yes, we're sir. good okay thanks uh item b is the um, jc booth middle school question and answers as we continue or have continued to receive questions we work to find information and answer those uh, you can see all of that is posted here on the agenda. I'm not going to go through and read questions and answers to you, but uh, I wanted the board to know that as we get those questions, we're responding uh, and we're making those public. So we'll continue to do that and, until we uh, get to a point where a decision is ultimately made. Where are those being made public? Is that uh, on our website. system web page, we've got a, a link right on the very front page <coughs> gotcha. where those are posted. And here you see these are right here in the um, um, in the eboard type. So I'm trying to find an eboard. Okay. <laughs> but we pulled them out, and okay, they're good. on the front page. Did we ever um, figure out like how many bus riders we think we have at Booth currently? It's bus riders. Just, just rough estimate. Right. Number of bus riders that currently, currently ride, ride the bus to Booth. Yeah. No, I've, I I want to make sure I'm clear. I think I'm confused on this. The uh, the road from Carriage Lane to Stagecoach, the the demolishing the house, building the road, and the sewer hookup, sewer pump station, all that's included in the price that we have. That is included but in the, the final GMP. Yes, that's correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The price we gave you, we we tried to include everything that we possibly could. So it should be an all-in price. Okay. okay. Any other questions there? Um, if not, I'll uh, move on down to item C, which is our attendance and enrollment uh, reports for the month. Uh, we're currently at 20,534. That's uh, in addition of 261 students more than last year. and. Uh, also like to note that our attendance is pretty strong. We're over 96% up to this point in time. Uh, that's something that we always encourage. And uh, if, if students come to school, we think we can do something there to help make sure they get a quality education. So uh, I won't go into any details there unless you have questions, but we feel good about the enrollment um, being on the uptick. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to make sure and share with the board uh, some reflections that came out of the 2019 Regional Educational Service Agency listening tour. Um, I think the board may be aware, but our general public may not be. Uh, the governor, his staff, the governor's office of student achievement, 
Um, and the uh, State Department of Education, Superintendent Woods and his staff, uh, they attended all 16 RISAs throughout the state. Our RISA, of course, is Griffin RISA. And uh, a lot of topic items that were discussed, high stakes testing, the social emotional learning, pathway to graduation, special needs, early learning, teacher prep. Uh, a hot topic was teacher uh, retirement system, evaluation, of course, uh, high needs fields for teachers in high, uh, difficult to hire content areas, uh, innovative approaches and practices that are going on school safety and climate funding, um, public education, um, certainly uh, responsible and aligned accountability. And uh, rural Georgia is a big part of what our state is made up of. That was a, a topic area for us. It's not so much an issue here in Fayette, but we do have a number of rural counties in our Griffin Risa. And last but not least, um, uh, collaboration and consistency of practice. Uh, our particular uh, listening tour was on April 30th. Uh, I will have to say this and, and commend uh, the Governor's Office of Student Achievement and our DOE. There's been more collaboration and communication, and I've been at this for a very long time. I've never seen this level of communication. So I want to commend them. I hope that continues, um, and certainly uh, we're proud to see that happen. I wanted the public to be able to see this so they could actually see the feedback. And um, certainly if you have any questions, we'll be happy to try to answer those. Uh, my understanding is, is that they're going to do that again this year and invite uh, uh, teachers and parents at different times to come again back to the RISA settings for conversations from that perspective as well. Any comments, questions? Yes, sir. If not, uh, as far as information is concerned, I do want to publicly announce we will be having um, our ribbon cutting here at the LAC central office. It's uh, October 21st. We'll be publishing this and sending out invitations. Uh, we're going to start early before the board meeting. We'll have an opportunity for um, tours. Uh, I know uh, Ms. Yolanda Briggs Johnson and her Students from Fayette County High are going to come over and be tour guides for us. I think they're playing some uh, uh, or orchestral music uh, in the lower A mm -hmm. building. We'll have some uh, reception items, and I really want the public to be able to come and see the transformation that happened uh, in one of our older buildings here. So we're uh, looking forward to seeing everyone on the 21st prior to the regular board meeting. Uh, Mr. Hollowell, that concludes all of my items here today. I do have uh, two executive session items we need to discuss. One is to uh, discuss authorized negotiations uh, with regard to property, and the second is to consult and meet uh, with legal counsel uh, pot uh, with pending or potential litigation, those two items. Okay, I need a um, motion and second to move to executive session to discuss property and a legal matter. So moved. Second. All in favor? I vote. Need a motion <laughs> and a second to return to, from executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Yep. I vote. Dr. Barrow, any recommendations? No, sir, no recommendations at this time. Great. Uh, without objection, we're adjourned. <laughs>